بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله إن شاء الله we're going to be talking about my experience uh, giving da'wah during the World Cup and before I start I want to start with a story that shows you just how interesting this World Cup was and that's the story of a group of Argentinians there was about eight of them who were coming to the Blue Mosque where we had tours and they came, and this is like before the, I think the quarter, the, the, the quarterfinals or semifinals, uh, they came and then after they came back. So they thought they were just coming back for a second visit. And then before, I think it was the, you know, the semifinals, they came back, you know, the final four, they came back again and they came back like a fourth time. And then before the finals, they came back again so it was like it was like five visits for them, right? So the people then asked, and the brothers who were there at the tour, they said, "What are you doing here?" You know, because they came for the first time, they did the tour, and after they, they did the tour, they kept coming back to the masjid, you know. And then it, obviously you could see now it's before like each match. So the people, the brothers asked them, "What are you guys doing here?" And they said that we came and we prayed to God. And, you know, they said we found tranquility in the mosque. We found it like as a, as a holy place. So we started to what we started to make dua here we start to pray here he said well, we started to pray uh, or when they went to the match and we were victorious so we had to come back and give thanks to the place where we we made the, the dua where we we, we prayed and, we, and it was accepted from god so they came back to give thanks then they came back for the dua before the the, the semifinals, and they came back after that uh, for the dua to give thanks and came back again to make dua before the finals so hopefully they came back after that allahu alam but alhamdulillah, it was very interesting. It just shows you how interesting this World Cup was. And there was a lot of experiences that we gained. And this is, inshallah ta'ala, what we're going to share with you guys tonight. Um, as many of you know, I was one of the main guys, you know, in, when it came to organizing. And I'll talk a bit more about my role in a, in, in a bit. And, you know, the question comes right away, how many people accepted Islam? We're going to mention that, inshallah ta'ala, uh, towards the end. And also we're going to talk about the biggest challenges that we faced in the Dawah. Uh, also, and the, the, there was a, a story that the Dawah had been stopped. Is this true? Was the Dawah stopped? Why was it stopped? We're going to talk about that in Shalom Ta'ala. We're going to mention some interesting stories. And we're going to mention the people who the Dawah had the biggest impact on them um, from those who were here during the World Cup. And also about a secret treasure that we discovered and giving da'wah during this World Cup uh, for those who are living in the Gulf and, and areas similar to the Gulf uh, region as well. But before I go into all of that, I want to mention that the people who were the biggest du'at during the World Cup, they were not the trained, specialized da'is. They were the Qatari people, the government, and all of the locals, and all of the residents, and even the Muslims who came from abroad, the ones who came from Saudi and other Arab countries, the, one that, the Muslims who came from Europe to support Morocco and what have you, all of them had a, had a great impact, alhamdulillah. All of them, they changed the world during this World Cup. We have to be honest and say how big of an impact that they had, because just the treatment that they had with people, and that's why I always focus in my, in my Dawah courses about the importance of the mu'amala and how you treat others, how you deal with others and the impact that has on the da'wah. So alhamdulillah that the, 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 the treatment of the Qataris and the locals uh, towards the, um, and even and it, to, toward, towards the, the, the visitors, it completely changed their mindset about Islam. It changed their mindset about Muslims it changed their mindset about, about Arabs and, and, the, it, it, and all of those people, how many million who came here, all of them are going to go back with that mindset as ambassadors to represent the reality. And I'm going to tell you an amazing story that, and, and also one of, one of the big supporters of Dawah that people might not think about before I tell you the story, is the Western media. They did a fantastic job in supporting the Dawah. They did, they're one of the best, and we have to say to them, thank you very much. And you might be shocked to hear that. How can the Western media <laughs> have done anything good with, with all of the attacks, all of the, the false and negative propaganda that they were spreading about Qatar? 
And that is because the people upon um, hearing that, they were very nervous, very pessimistic. And then when they actually came here and saw for themselves, it completely changed it. So they exposed the reality of the, uh, of the Western media and their, their narratives. Uh, and in the story I was going to tell you, it was actually, I met, I met two guys from uh, Uruguay, Uruguay, that they, um, uh, they're actually, they live in America, so they're dual citizens, and they were rooting for, uh, for Uruguay and also for America, for both teams there, both of their teams here in the World Cup, mashallah. So I met them outside of the Blue Mosque, which we'll talk about in a minute, and they were at a booth, which was for the Qatari sisters. And this booth was, you know, ask the Qatari women. The Qatari women, these oppressed women, as we were going with the brothers to the opening match, we we're driving down the road and I said, our brother, I said, we should take a picture of this. I was just embarrassed to do it, honestly. I wish I had of this uh, oppressed Qatari woman, you know, poor, poor Meskina, driving her Rolls Royce, um, you know, with her niqab, which was amazing. She had a niqab on, she's in a Rolls Royce. Her husband, in his traditional dress sitting next to her, two other Naqabi sisters behind her, and here's this Meskina driving her Rolls Royce. And she, she, she has a, a, a horrible life, you know? I said, I said, this is what they need to see in the Western media. So there was this booth. It was one of the best things that we had, alhamdulillah. These sisters, you know, local sisters, Qatari sisters. There were some Indian sisters there, some um, uh, American sister. I believe there's a sister from Colombia as well. Her sisters who were there, also speaking with them for obviously the language reasons. And people would come and ask the, the women any directly. So when they came, they said, these, these guys from your way, they told me that... Um, we, uh, we realized that the Western media has completely brainwashed us. And hearing from these women directly, we know the reality now. And they told me an amazing story. They said, you know, how hospitable the, pe the people have been here. They said that they were at a restaurant and they were trying to pay. And the people told them, the guy at the cashier said, didn't have much English. He told them, no, you can't pay. So he said, okay, we're trying to pay in cash. Then we tried to pray, pray, pray in card. And they wouldn't accept any of it, okay? So he couldn't understand what was happening. So then they said, no, the police paid for it. The police, the police paid for your meal. And they were shocked. And they said, you know, we, we looked outside and we see the, you know, these country police officers, you know, giving us salams, uh, you know, saying hello to us. And they had paid for our meal. And he said, it's amazing because he said, in our country, the police steal from us. And here we are in, country, uh, in, in Qatar, where they are actually paying for our meals. It was amazing. So for them, it was, it was like, you know, a really eye-opener, life-changing experience. And that's how it was, you know, for everyone from the non-Muslims that we spoke to. So that was the, 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 the main thing that, you know, the people and how they were treating the people, how hospitable they were, uh, how organized the, the government had organized everything. Absolutely amazing. Um, and that, like we said, it, it's going to change the world and how the people look at Muslims uh, and, and, and Arabs as, as well. The question about how did we give dawah? How was the dawah? Our approach to the dawah was not a direct dawah. It was through culture, through the thaqafa. And that is because right away when people ask about the, 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 the customs, you know, they start to ask about the customs. Right away, Islam comes into play. And then they start to understand that the reason we have these cultures, it's because of Islam. And that's the, the core of the society, the base of the society. It's all based on Islamic teachings and Islamic principles. So if you look, for example, they say these people are so hospitable. The countries are so hospitable. Why is that? Because the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Man akhir, That whoever believed in Allah in his last day, they um, then he should be hospitable towards his guests. So it's from the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Therefore, and he, that was a, a madkhal, it was a way to enter into giving dawah and to having you know, very quality conversations. So one of the, the approaches that we would use, for example, how have you found Qatar? And they, they were just amazed, blown away about how beautiful the country is, about how organized everything was, about how hospitable people were. And so then you would say, you know, not like you heard in the Western media, right? And they'd be like, it's a totally different story. So that being said, alhamdulillah, um, that was the, 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 the approach. First time in a Muslim country, uh, yes, no, 
what do you know about Islam? And then the, 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 the dialogues would start after that. So it was, a, it was a cultural approach. And I've been saying this for years that we need to focus more on the culture. And, and why is that? Because people in general, they're more inclined to listen about culture than they are about um, to, listen, to listen about religion. And that's just something reality. So why now am I drinking a Thai? Bismillah. What is a Thai? What's the, the thaqafa, the history, the culture behind a Thai? Uh, and, and if you, you know my story, then you know why I'm drinking. You know what it is. It's Moroccan green tea. Is it? Oh, it's mint tea. No, this one's not with mint. It was something else. That's it. You guys have to find out what it is. Huh? This is all part. This is all part of the culture. Huh? We, we, it's not just Moroccans. Mashallah, mutafannin. They have many things they drink their tea with. Not just nah, nah, The mint might be the original, but what is it? So that's that's a cultural conversation that I can open up a lot of doors for. Why am I wearing this? Maybe you guys understood it, right? I do wear it sometimes, anyways. Alhamdulillah. But that, what is the behind that? And I, I remember one, one guy, he said, I have a question. I said, I have to ask you, please. This guy from Mexico, he lived he studied in America. He said, how are your thobes so white? And they were, all, they were impressed at how, how white the thobes are. How do you keep them so white, you know? So that, that was a dialogue. And that, actually, if you even want to look from that, so why do you wear that white? It's because the Prophet, alayhi salatu his favorite colors was, was, his favorite color was white. And he encouraged us to wear white. So that's also a way to enter. You know, I remember in Ireland, you know, people were talking about building a mosque and building this. And he said, we can build something in the capital in Dublin. I said, what we need to do is we, if you, on one of the main streets, open up uh, an, an, a, 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 a place for just for cultural. I mean, we meet people, people come in. We have like, you know, the, the Arab Bedouin tent where they would uh, come in and, and learn about this. And part of, the, of our culture, as well, the main thing about our culture is obviously about Islam. So that's alhamdulillah how we started, alhamdulillah. Uh, our, our conversation, and that's how it went. We forbid our du'at from getting into uh, debates using uh, Christianity and Bible and, and Jesus in the Bible, Muhammad in the Bible. Uh, we didn't use that approach at all. We'll talk about that, inshallah, in a minute. But that was our, was our approach. That's how we, we, we focused on giving the da'wah, alhamdulillah. Um, my, my role was more of an organizational role for this one. Um, it's something I haven't done. I, I'm always a consultant. That's what I do. And it's one of my things as I'm a consultant, but that's, you know, just kind of as, as an advisor, but to actually be there in the trenches and to be organized. So that was, it was, it was a, it was a different role for me. Um, beneficial and very difficult at the same time. Um, from the beginning, Alhamdulillah, I was able to train over 1000 people in both Arabic and English. Alhamdulillah. Uh, we did the go rap course with them, and that's the approach that we took. And, 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 and we would uh, give dawah. It's only using the go rap approach. Alhamdulillah, so over a thousand people took that course with me before the World Cup. Alhamdulillah, and then just to supervise on on the dawah and on the duats after that. Um, my one of the main goals that I set down for the duat and for our, the program that we had with the brothers who organized with me is that we had a protection policy. And this is a, a very important lesson for us in the Dawah. We have to protect our Dawah. So the first thing that we need to protect is our religion, our Islam. That some that it's not, you know, looked at in, in a negative way or not, not misrepresented. So it looks bad because of the actions of some individual. Even a lot of du'at, by the way, if they don't really know what they're doing, they can make Islam look bad. So we're very keen that our religion doesn't look bad. We protect our religion. We protect our Dawah so it can continue. We protect the dola, the country that is the host country in Qatar, making sure that they are not um, put in a position where they're in any trouble and issue because of an overzealous brother giving dawah, sometimes with a good intention, but making a mistake in his approach and how he gives dawah and causing more harm than good. So we were keen on that. And then obviously the dawah organizations and the Ministry of Religious Affairs and Qatar Guest Center, um, the ones who are on the ground, that we don't want them to have any, any problems, any ihraj, we put them in, in, into a bad position. Uh, so alhamdulillah, we had a policy that we set down that for, for anyone who was who, who, from the volunteers, that's what we had. We had volunteers who come in to, to volunteer for this uh, cultural approach, alhamdulillah. And you know, we had things like we said, we, we don't allow debating about uh, 
you know, Christianity and differences and, uh, you know, Muhammad in the Bible, Jesus in the Bible, any contradictions in the Bible. That's not the approach that we took and we didn't allow it. Uh, a cultural approach. And then if someone was interested to learn more about Islam, in that case, we would talk using the go rap approach, focusing on what? And if you, any of you have taken the course with me, you know, I always put it on hammering on it the whole, the whole time is that we're saying in the go rap approach, what we believe as Muslims, because what we're doing, we're farmers, we plant seeds, we plant the seeds and the inshallah for the guidance and for the good of, of humanity, only explaining what we believe. We don't want to get into debates, to get into, into manakasha and get in, into uh, these type of things. It's, it's not um, mis mi 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 difficult questions, trying to answer them, um, misconceptions, trying to remove them. That's not our job. Our job is just to explain what we believe. And that's obviously level one, ABC Dawah. And that's how we focused, alhamdulillah. So we, we took, obviously, you know, the, the, the written agreement. Anybody works, you, that, that's how you give Dawah. You stay away, for example, the issues of uh, uh, the migrant workers and their situation. Obviously, we know that that was you know blown way out of proportion. If you live, like myself, I've been here for many years and culture coming back and forth. Uh, that's blown way out of proportion. And there's been a lot of improvement in that. But even with even me knowing that, we made it very, any that this is not for us to talk. We're talking about culture and Islam, that's it. We're not talking about any of these, these hot topics, LGBTQZP, any of this stuff, we're not, we're not talking about this. It's not, it has nothing to do with us. We're not talking about it. Um, and also one of the things that we focused on was the issue of um, not filming and putting stuff out there. Later, as you saw, if you saw some of the videos from my era, yes, we put, uh, we put those out after the World Cup, but during the World Cup, we didn't put those out because of the problems can call. And that's a great, great lesson, yeah, Juan. And we're going to come to that, inshallah, in a minute. That's one of the things you really benefited from, uh, from this experience. When it came to, you know, working with media, we didn't do TV channel after TV channel. Um, they came to us and were asking us for interviews uh, with our volunteers. We didn't allow them to do any interviews, especially with Western media or Arab media, because obviously through experience, as the Prophet والسلام, said, that the mu'min doesn't get bit from the same hole twice. And when you look at um, you know, these individuals and throughout history, they're always causing problems, cutting stuff off, uh, putting false, false stuff out there. Therefore, we don't, we don't want to get into any issues. As we share, we had the protection policy. So as, as the, the Arab expression says, that, you know, the, the door that the wind comes through, is, the wind is harming you, that you close the door and you relax. So we didn't do any interviews. Some of, of, of the TV channels from South America, we allowed those because they seemed, you know, more, um, you know, middle ground and, 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 and weren't people who had, you know, hidden agendas. So some of them, we, we, we had some of our volunteers or do, I, do interviews with them. So that was the, the media policy. Now, you might have heard that the Dow was stopped. And I, I know Dr. Zakir, many from around the world, they call me. Is it true that that was stopped? There was an issue. There was a couple of issues. You know, one of them was an individual from um, a neighboring country. Uh, he went and made this post about, you know, 500 and, and was it 548 or 58? 558 people have accepted Islam and this. And, and then the media took it and blew up with it. And, you know, the World Cup has even started. And through the Dawah, 558 have accepted Islam. And that was false that was fabricated I mean, the number was correct but it wasn't in Qatar that's the crazy thing that number was actually online it was from our brothers in e-dialogue and they're um they're they're doing this all the time anyways this is the numbers they get each week during their online dawah so this had nothing to do with Qatar but he used that and talking about dawah in Qatar it, it wasn't properly what he did I, I heard he tried to rectify that later but nonetheless the damage is already done so that caused a lot of damage um, and, and, and other brothers who were filming and uploading things, even though they were told not to, that also caused a lot of damage. But alhamdulillah, we were able to fix that and you know get things back on track. And it was just one one of the main um, uh, challenges that we faced. But alhamdulillah, and it's one, it, it's a, it was a good learning experience, and it showed us because we're so keen and we're so used to you know always um, 
you know, filming and putting everything online. And it, that does have its benefits. I, I'm speaking to you now. I have a camera here. I'm on Facebook. I'm here on Zoom on YouTube. I'm here on Instagram, okay? So I, I'm, I'm on three different platforms as, as we're speaking, right? So, you know, getting things documented, getting online is beneficial, but not everything needs to be put online. That's, that was a great lesson and a great benefit that we took from this campaign that you can have a, a good impact in, in, in this. And everybody knew what we were doing, subhanAllah, you know? And he, all around the world, you know, when I meet people, people knew, and alhamdulillah, nothing was put online, alhamdulillah. So it shows you when you, when you, when you and you inshallah have ikhlas and you work hard, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it's not documented, then inshallah, it can still be beneficial, inshallah wa ta'ala. So not everything has to be put online. And another lesson is that certain things put online can actually be quite harmful. So you have to be uh, careful when you, when you look at the um, the du'at who took you know part in the, in this great event, um, many 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 positive lessons to be gained, many inspirational stories to be gained, uh, many negative stories. To believe it or not, now that's one of the great things that we benefit is you know learning people and learning how to deal with du'at. You know, I'm coming from a generation. You say, Sheikh, you're not that old. Yes, I'm not that old. But I was always with my elders, those who are older than me. I benefited from, even in Jahidi, this is how I was. I always benefit from the, the, the elders so I can learn from what, from what they've done, the pioneers, and not fall into the same mistakes they, they have fallen into, right? And that kept me out of a lot of trouble even before Islam. So, you know, for me, basically, what do you, when I know when you talk about giving dawah, that means you give dawah until you drop. Non-stop. Dr. Zakir, for example, Yusuf Estes, they speak about they, they sleep three to three and a half hours a day. Non-stop dawah. That's how I was raised. That's the dawah that I know. Okay. So when a brother tells me he's tired, a brother has six hours. You know, some of the younger brothers, you know, they don't they don't have to be, I don't know. They're supposed to have higher testosterone than the older guys, right? But uh, but I guess you know a different generation, this and that that was that was something um, you know different for us, something you know. Wow, I thought I thought were joking and said, and one of them said, "Do we get a day off?" I said, "A day off." I said, "I didn't, I didn't know there was a day off when you, when you give dawah. I never heard of that. You know, I thought it was, a, I thought people were actually joking, but they were, they were serious. But alhamdulillah, even with that, you know, brothers did, you know, do a lot of hard work. You know, even some of the ones who complained a bit, they stepped up when they had to. May Allah bless them. So, if you look at some of the examples, our brother Sheikh Isa Garcia from uh, Argentina came from Colombia. Um, he had a 40 hour, 40 hour flight, you know, left his family for an entire month. And I have so much respect for these brothers because I'm sitting here talking to you. I, I took nine months out of my life for this event. Yes, my family was with me, you know, alhamdulillah, it's a blessing of Allah. I don't know if I could do that. I had to take a four hour flight. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have to take a, a you know, 40 hours. Yeah. I mean, and yeah, I, I don't know if I could have done that, you know, maybe business class. I don't know. But you, you're flying economy from airline to airline, from airport to airport, man. That that's that's some serious jihad there, tough bro. So, but that, that's what he did. May Allah bless him. And, and another example, our brother uh, Raphael. Um, you know, these are the dua, all of them from the dua of Aira. and the dua of Aira, um, You know, I was really impressed from our dua from Aira, man. Really, you know, as someone who, you know, as a leader, you know. You have your, 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 your soldiers, right? You give the orders, you expect it to be done. The era guys get it done. The era guys, mashallah. You put them in a place, you give them instructions, one, two, three, it's done one, two, three. And they can even make it better and, 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 and give you some advice in this. And it, fantastic, uh, brothers. Really, really beautiful working with them. A great experience. Uh, other brothers are brothers from Discover Islam UK. Our brothers from EF Dawa, I was really impressed. I was a bit nervous, I'm to be honest. The first time I actually met the brothers from EF Dawa, who, who came brother Hashem Abbas and uh, Ijaz and those and those guys, but uh, you know, because their their style is more. I uh, mean, you, you might think a speakers' corner is more of a debate style, but when they understood, you know, the do's and don'ts, I mean, they did a fantastic job in their Dawa. I was, I was really impressed, and, and their, their style, I really enjoyed it. And really enjoyed my time being with them. So they did, they did a fantastic job as, as well. So you look at some of the stories from some of the brothers from, from uh, the Duat. Also, we have Brother Raphael from Mexico. Uh, I did a podcast with him. Also, he did something with Aira as well. 
I did a more in-depth podcast with him, with Isa Garcia. And that podcast will be coming out soon, inshallah ta'ala, uh, on my YouTube channel, Bidnilai uh, ta'ala. So, Brother Raphael, he would work 14, 16-hour days, no problem. Because we needed the Spanish language. Because the majority of people coming for the tours, they, they were from Latin America. So he was there, never complaining. Even one time, he's like, man, I really have to go to the toilet. He was telling brother, I would play. So then uh, a, a group comes in for a tour. So he's like, okay, I'll, I'll take them. Finish with them. He's like, I got to go to the toilet. Another group comes. Another group comes. He's, he still hasn't gone to the toilet. So he's there waiting like three, four hours. And, he, you know, just, just kind of hoping it in so he can make sure he can give the Dao. May Allah bless him. Because he didn't want to lose the opportunity of giving Dao and going to the toilet. Another example, uh, we had our brother Oni from Tanzania. Our brother Koyabab from... Um, from uh, from the Philippines. Also, I did a video with him in Salah in Depth. Also, Aira, uh, they did a video with him. Uh, really inspirational stories. Our brother Silman from Japan. Um, brother Koyabab, uh, it was amazing because you know, it was a very emotional story. And even you're going to see when you watch the the the, uh, the podcast I did with him, he's gonna, you're going to see him break down in tears. Very emotional, subhanAllah. Even our brother Eddie from Brazil is another warrior, mashallah, from the Ayur Duat. Also, you see, he gets very emotional as well about, about dawah and, and having a class and working hard for the dawah. These guys were, were, were true soldiers, mashallah, may Allah bless them. So, this, uh, his name is Romeo, actually, Romeo, Koyaba Romeo. So, when he came, he actually accepted Islam here, like in like 2010, I believe it was, or 2011, in Qatar. So, he became Muslim here, and he became Muslim at the Qatar Guest Center, right? So he became Muslim here. He learned all of, of the foundational stuff for the new Muslim program with Qatar Guest Center. And then in 2012, he left. And then he went back to his homeland in, in, um, in, uh, in the Philippines. When he went back to the Philippines, uh, he became a, a, a very good and, and, and famous and big guy there, mashallah. He now works for, for Ayur. He's one of the Ayur uh, guys, one of the main guys. And you can look on my, my, my channels, my, all my platforms. I put it there the other day, a video of more 50 plus people taking their, their shahada with him in the village, mashallah. Very, very, very beautiful brother. So when he walked in the first day, he walked into the Qatar guest center. He saw his sheikhs and those who had taught him the basic, who he accepted Islam through them. And then who had um, taught him the, the basics of Islam, him seeing it, it was very emotional for him. The first time being back in 10 years, the first time being back since he left Qatar, he broke down into tears. It was emotional for all of us, you know, being in that situation, seeing that subhanAllah. And then alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened up and, and he, uh, the hearts of many people through this brother from the Filipinos. More than 50 of them accepted Islam uh, as he was here, alhamdulillah, during, during the World Cup. And, you know, did a, did a fantastic job. And he, and he gave a lesson for the du'at. He went for Umrah for a couple of days and came back. He came back like at 10 o'clock. He said, should I go to my dawah post? Should I go to, to the stall, the dawah stall to, to give dawah? You know, he, he, he called right away to, 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 to the brothers to see what, what should I do? Ready to give dawah. And then you, a video, I'm going to post it soon. You'll see it, inshallah. Until right before his flight, he's out in the field giving dawah. You know, you can see him as he's walking off. He's giving dawah, and then he's like, he's got to run to catch his flight. Mashallah, tabarakallah. That this, you know, those type of, of beautiful stories and you'll see that, inshallah. A lot of these, we have them also coming up. And the new podcast we have that will be out uh, soon, inshallah. Ta'ala. Obviously, one of the things we learned from the du'at is that many of the du'at, even though they give a lot of da'wah, some of them still, honestly, they, they don't get it. You know, they're, they're, Some of them are stuck on the old ways, you know, the 1980s uh, into the 90s, I guess. You know, Da'wah of you know, debating Christians and, and the Bible and all of this. And even though we tell them not to use that, and it, not, not really from our group, this, we saw this in some other groups um, who were you know, just focusing on it and, and, and too much. There could be a time for that. There could be a place for that. Yes, I understand that. But um, un, un, unfortunately, um, you know, sometimes people just don't understand how to give dawah. Talking about issues that are not suitable. So a lot of brothers, even though they have knowledge, even though they're involved in dawah, they're still giving dawah wrong. And, and, and that, that's a main problem that we've seen many throughout the years. Uh, and, and it hasn't changed with many of our brothers, unfortunately. They still want to hold on to always agreeing down. And, and it's not the correct, or even if it does work sometimes, it's not the best or the most fruit, fruitful way of giving dawah. 
uh, inshallah. Um, if you look at the different Dawah organizations, you have you know Dawah organizations that were from inside and, and, and from outside. Um, when it comes to inside, you know, there's three main organizations. You had obviously the religious affairs. They did some very good programs, you know, mosque tours. And, you know, obviously, because one of the objectives, the main objectives is to remove the barriers. And that's why I, I was so, one of the, the positive things, I don't, I don't want to say anything positive, honestly, that came from such a horrible experience like 9-11. But and it, for us as a Muslim community in the West, we were forced to become more open because many of our uncles and older generations who, who established Islam in the West, they were very, very closed and not very open to having, for example, the non-Muslim community come to, for mosque tours. But after 9-11, like what's going on in these mosques? This is where the training grounds are. Oh my God, you know? And, and um, you know, like we have, you have you have hidden you know, training centers under the mosque or something, you know? So they let people start to come in. They were forced to come in. And this actually, it's a prophetic tradition. If you look into the sunnah of our beloved prophet, Ali salatu wasalam, uh, when he actually took Thumama ibn Uthal as a, uh, as a prisoner of war, he had him be you know, tied up in the masjid for him to see Islam firsthand. Also, uh, for him to, um, uh, the non-Muslims, the delegation that would come, they would come into the mosque. So that's actually the, one, one of the main ways to give da'wah, but unfortunately we, we went away from that. So that, that came back. So that's one of the, in the West, and also it's one of the things that was you know, done here for the tours, like I said, because this removes the barriers. It removes the misconceptions. Has, people come see what firsthand what it is that we're doing. We're not hiding anything. We're not, you know, as, as, as the, the, the Western media makes us out to be, it's, it, it, these are all lies and, 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 and fabrications. Come look and come here for yourself, alhamdulillah. So that was an opportunity, you know, with the mosque tours. Also, they had you know, a, a VR and, you know, for the Fanar Center, they also had a, a, an exhibition there. It, it, was, it was very good, uh, Organizations from outside, you know, the main organization from outside from the Du'at was Ayira, and you can see the videos online. Fantastic job. We already mentioned some of that. Discover Islam, EF Dawa brothers, they did a fantastic job as well. Jazamullah khair. Also, you had Sahaba Academy, which you're here with us on the platform now. Alhamdulillah, uh, did a fantastic job in helping you know, the, the organization from the beginning. And also, uh, Jim'iyat uh, Ihya Turath uh, from Kuwait also did a fantastic job. And you know, when it came to the, 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 the books and other materials, and they were ready to do anything that we needed for Dawah. Alhamdulillah, they did a fantastic job and supporting what they could. Obviously, there are certain things you can and cannot do. Uh, you know, by, by the laws, obviously, we, we play everything by the books. So, you know, they, would, they, they printed materials on, on their uh, own. Um, uh, they, they paid for the printing of, of, of the Dao materials. And may Allah bless them. And we learn from this. And it's one of the main lessons that we learn from this experience is that so many people talked. We're going to do this. We're going to help out like this. We're going to do that. But when it came time for them to actually do anything, they did nothing. So, so many people talk to, they talk to talk, but they can't walk the walk. This is what we learned. And they know the ones who actually, uh, you know, say and act upon what they say, they're very little, very little. Uh, you know, and this is something which we, we know for the future and working with individuals that a lot of people want to talk, but not many people are, are, are going to act. There's also, you know, different individuals. Um, who did things on their own. We had some brothers and sisters who came from Kuwait. They found a tent that wasn't being utilized and they sat there, alhamdulillah, and you know, more than a hundred people took their shahada to them. V very beautiful brothers. I know them very well, mashallah. Also, we had one of our brothers from Saudi and I did a podcast with him, one in Arabic and one in English. And, and if you're going to use you know, the Bible and Dawah, he is a very fantastic way of, of doing it. And I want to benefit from that. So that's going to be on our podcast coming up soon as well, inshallah ta'ala. Our brother Abdullah al Nizi, he had almost about 50 shahadas. And we said in the beginning that there was, we, we discovered a hidden treasure. And what he did, he said, I, I, I talked with some of the fans, a guy from America accepted Islam, some others. But he said, I started, I, I said, let me go talk to the security guard, you know, from Africa, most of them from Kenya. He said, I started to talk to him. He said, within 20 minutes, he, he took a shahada, accepted Islam. So I went to the next one, the next one. He said, Alhamdulillah, more than 25 people, 25 security guards 
accepted Islam. They're standing there all day, no one's talking to them. Many of them are very interested in Islam, but no one ever talked to them. So alhamdulillah, even I saw I was with a Qatari brother. We were on the metro, and subhanAllah, uh, he just met up with, with also a guy from Kenya, started talking to him five minutes. The guy was about to take a shahada, but we, we, he had to get off at the next stop, so we didn't, uh, we, we, uh, he took his number. But um, alhamdulillah, it, it just shows you how easy it is for some of these individuals that uh, many times people don't talk to them. But once you do talk to them, alhamdulillah, many of them accept Islam. طيب, the question that comes is, and you probably heard some of this, who are the people who were impacted the most because of the Dawah? Which group? And hands down, it was the Latin Americans. The Latin Americans. Then if you saw the impact, if you saw how they were coming for the mosque tours, if you saw how they were coming um, for the, 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 the different the stalls or the tents that we had, and just come and wanted to talk. And when you give them materials, wallahi, they read it. Even some of them, I have a picture of this, uh, this guy from Brazil. He's coming to the match. When they gave him some Portuguese document material, immediately sat down and read it all. And we saw many of them doing this. So they, they want to read. They're, they're not, they haven't been distorted by the technology as much as, as the Westerners. They still want to read it, alhamdulillah. Um, even a story, there was a, one of our brothers who opened up his majlis, you know, the traditional Qatri uh, majlis where, where they come for their gatherings and sittings. And he said that uh, there was, a, and they came obviously men and women, and one of the women, she wasn't really dressed properly, Argentinian. Um, they gave them a gift bag. And in that gift bag, there was a translation of the Quran in Spanish. And when she saw that, she was like, oh my God. And they were like, why is she so happy? She pulled the Quran out and she kisses the Quran and then puts it onto her heart, subhanAllah. So the thing is, this, this well-dressed woman, uh, an uh, undressed woman, not, not probably dressed woman, I mean, you wouldn't think that she would be like, what, what is this with the Quran? She said, I've been looking for this. She said, I want to read the Quran so bad. And she kisses it and puts it next to her heart, subhanAllah. It was, it was, it was an a, a, a amazing story. So the Argentinians, the Mexicans, the Brazilians, obviously they were the biggest group, but you had from, you know, from, uh, you know, from Uruguay, from other, uh, the other, uh, you know, the, uh, South American countries, they're, they're, they also were coming, but these were the biggest groups, those three. And, you know, if, if you ask, what is the reason why? The reason why, first of all, is that they're closer to fitra. The natural inclination that they were graded upon, they're still very close to that and very keen on holding on to they haven't been corrupted like you know individuals in the West. And if this is the religion of Allah, the fitra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the inclination that he put in, as the Prophet said, fitra, that every any human is 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 born upon the fitra, this natural inclination. So the people from South America, they're still close to that. Secondly, if you go into the Quran and you look in Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter 25, verses 82 and 83, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the ones who have the most adawa, the most animosity, the most hatred towards Islam and the Muslims, and then the ones who are closer to them, aqrabuhum mawadda, the closest in love and affection, he said that they are the Nasara, the Christians. If you look why they're the closest, Go to the end of the verse on the on the bottom of the page on page uh, on, on verse eighty two. What did the law say? Annahum la that they do not have the kibber. They're not arrogance, because what arrogance does it makes a person be veiled from the truth, not being able to see the truth. And that's why when you look at the European, um, the Europeans, they have this uh, complex where they see themselves being better than others. They have this arrogance to them where they see themselves being better and looking down upon you know, other individuals, other nationalities, whether it be something directly or indirectly. Okay, and Some of them might not mean to do it, but they, that, that's part of, uh, of the culture. Obviously, I'm from them. <laughs> I know that very well. Is that and when they, they look at you know, Muslims, they look at Arabs, they look at Asians, they look down upon them. So how can they accept a religion from the person they look down upon? Whereas the ones from South America don't have that. So that opened up the doors. And then if you look at verse 83, what did Allah say? 
He said, if they hear what was sent down to the messenger, that you see the, 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 the tears coming in their eyes. From what they know from, uh, uh, from the haq, from, from, the, from the truth. So once they hear that truth, you would see the impact. And wallahi, in the mosque tours, you would see many of them when they would hear about Islam and hear about the, the, the mosque and the tradition, that they would, their eyes would tear up and some of them actually would even cry. That's how emotional they, they would get. So it's just, like, just exactly as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was describing them uh, in, in, in the Quran. So th these are any, uh, the in, mo individuals who had the most impact. What were the, the, we talked about how we gave da'wah, but what were some of the, of the wasail? So we talked about how the approach we used. So uh, obviously the mosque tour would probably be a bit different um, because people were coming in to see what is the mosque tour, what goes on the mosque. So you would explain to them what goes on to the mosque. And then most of the time you ask the question, what do you see here that's different? And right away, when people have been to churches, and you know other places of worship, they see right away. There's no idols. There's no asnam. Okay, so yes. Why is this the meaning of la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah? The meaning of salat, about tawheed. So that was that was the approach in the masjid. So we had you had the mosque tours, the mosque tours like in the Blue Mosque in Qatar. It was amazing. Mashallah. Sometimes up to one thousand five hundred visits or more a day. Even one of the small mosques called the Gold Mosque there. There was sometimes up to 400 visits a day. It's like more like a prayer room, honestly. It's very small, but nonetheless, people will still want to see it. And they were going for the tour up to 200, 300, 200, 300 a day in that small mosque, some to the 400. And the, in the blue mosque, the bigger mosque, a uh, very beautiful mosque there in Qatar, 1,500, sometimes up to 2,000 daily uh, people coming for tours to visit the mosque, spending time there with the Muslims. Um, you know, very, very, very beautiful. Uh, a very beautiful a way of, 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 of introducing them and showing them the reality of what it is that we believe. They, some of them would stay and actually watch the prayer and see firsthand, alhamdulillah. And obviously we had a, a sister section and it was interesting because we would break it down in the masjid. Okay, you're going to come in, your wife's going to go from the woman's entrance to, you know, to take the experience of how she done. The sisters would put an abaya on her, put a hijab on her, so she would wear the hijab and she would come in and, and she would meet her husband obviously inside. They would come together inside. We wouldn't keep them any uh, separated inside. They would come together. Uh, even one time, one of the guys, he was like, uh, he looked over. He said, you don't know who this lady is? He was like, no, it's his wife. He didn't know who she was. <laughs> and gosh, when she put the hijab on, she looked different. He's like, he realized in, in a bit, it was his wife. He's like, wow, you know, look at the difference in how, how she looks, subhanAllah. So that was, you know, a, a really amazing experience for many of them. And that's one of the things um, that, and there's a, there's a video, it's online. Uh, I'll put it up later as well. Uh, a Filipino lady, and she accepted Islam alhamdulillah, later, but she hadn't accepted Islam, she just put on the abaya, because in, in, the, in the, the, the area in the souk, in the, in the market, the traditional market, where we had the, 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 the tent, or you can say the booth or the stall that we had there, people would come and they, they would let them try their traditional dress, so the women would wear the abaya, uh, wear the, uh, you know, the, the hijab, and the men would wear like this, you know, the, the bisht, and he would wear the the khutra, the traditional you know, scarf of, of the man for the head with the iqal, and they would take pictures. And then they would start asking questions themselves about the culture, ask questions about Islam, and our volunteers would, would explain to them. And it, it was very, one of the brothers who was there, may Allah bless him, Sheikh Nilain, he actually uh, became a real Muslim. He was in the nation of Islam before. He accepted real Islam in 1975. He was one of the bodyguards of Muhammad Ali, rahimahullah ta'ala. He, he was one of the guys... And this guy, man, he didn't, he wasn't, he wasn't taking breaks. He was, he was going, mashallah, hardcore in the dawah. And, you know, he was bringing the people in and you could see some of the videos and he had a, I know, really, really nice approach, mashallah. Uh, you know, he, he put the, 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 the traditional dress on. He said, we have Sheikh, you know, you know, Caesar from, from Guatemala, or wherever the guy's from, you know, and, and people would start cheering on for him. And it, it was really a beautiful experience, mashallah. Also, the brothers in the Ministry of, of Religious Affairs, they had the VR, so they, people would take the, the trip to Mecca, and that had a huge impact as well, alhamdulillah. Our sisters in a group uh, called Hawiyati, uh, they had a, a program as well. They're in Qatar, close to the Blue Mosque, did a fantastic job as well. The sisters who had the Ask the Qatari women, also a fantastic job as well, and meeting with the people and talking to the people. Um, when you look at the, you know, the, uh, the biggest obstacles that we faced, um, I don't want to go into too much detail, uh, try to keep it as positive as possible, but 
some of the main obstacles, you know, were from individuals or, you know, places that you wouldn't think that shouldn't, you know, have a problem with the Dawa, but unfortunately they did. Other people you think would be difficult when it would come to Dawa and stuff like this, they were actually very supportive. So that was a bit strange, but you know, it, it is what it is. You have to, you know, that, but that teaches a day that you have to, um, you know, work with what you can. I remember I was, I was giving some Dawa some time back and the brother said, well, you need permission for this and this. Uh, okay, so the brother said, I own a coffee shop. You don't need permission to give Dawa and, and the coffee shop in, in, in that country. I said, Bismillah, let's do it, right? So I gave my, I gave my, uh, I gave a course, 40, 50 brothers in the coffee shop on, on, the, on the second floor. <laughs> and it, it, that, that's how it was, Alhamdulillah. So it doesn't matter. Uh, it, it just, you, you have to go, what is it? It was a great learning experience, but nonetheless, and there were some some serious challenges. Like I said, I don't want to go into to them, uh, you know, stay away from those issues. But and we, we faced a lot of stuff, you know, that uh, unfortunately, um, uh, that, that, you know, we, we, we think we should, we didn't think we would, but um, that we dealt with it and it, it went, it went well, alhamdulillah. Um, there was a lot of political gain that happened as well. Uh, don't talk much about politics, but on, on a political front, uh, the issue of Palestine and the love that the Muslim and non-Muslims that they have for Palestine, that was, that was very, very powerful. The Palestinian flag everywhere, that was very powerful. Um, the issue of the reality of the, the Western media and, and politics, that came even more clear. The people who had any doubt that was removed. And we're talking about even non-Muslims, not, not just Muslims. Even non-Muslims, they were disgusted with these, you know, these, these, these double standards uh, and the, the, the lies and, and fabrications that, that the Western media was spreading, but they were exposed. So that, that obviously would end up being a gain, even though it was, it was you know, something difficult in the beginning, obviously. Uh, people who have good relations that working with, all of a sudden they're, they're, they're warning against you, like, what is this? You know, they, you know they look, we, we, the governments have been well with each other for all these years, and then they're being attacked you know, by these individuals, or these, these countries, and I'm telling people not to watch the World Cup and uh, the BBC cutting off part of it, subhanAllah, the, the opening ceremony, which has never happened before. Also, you know, a certain group and certain individuals uh, known by certain letters, um, you know, their plan, you know, it backfired on them big time, big time it backfired on them because they were trying to push their narrative. And we're not talking about just people here who they, 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 they push back and or rub the wrong way, as you would say, but even in the West and other, and other countries, non-Muslim countries, like you can't force those type of things on people. You, if, if that's your way of life, and that's, that's the laws of your country, that's something else. We can't say anything about that, but you can't force your laws and your culture on another country. And many, many, many people took you know, fantastic stances and both Muslim and non-Muslims alike uh, when it came to that. So that, that backfired, so that, that, that was you know, a political uh, gain, any, uh, as well and because i mean this this is common sense where you shouldn't be able to you shouldn't be able to force your way on, on other people right i sit here and talk now about what i believe islam the religion of truth something i believe i don't force it on anybody and you, you're free to take from me if you want free to not take it from me we can have a nice conversation about it and you know each one you know happily go their way at the end but no those individuals are like no you have to accept our way and in fact now it's, you have to actually support our way like why? Because if that's something we don't believe in or we don't follow, why would we, would we have to force your way on it? You know, we talk about freedom and freedom of speech, freedom of this and freedom of that. Then we can either, you can easily see that was exposed that it's not a reality. So that's probably you know, as they say, any nafia, something that was negative. That a lot of good actually came about it. But uh, let's wrap up now, my brothers and sisters, with you know the question that everyone wants to know: What were the results? How many people? Uh, accepted Islam. Um, you know, through our, our, our group, we had about uh, 1,000 plus shahadas, alhamdulillah. There were some people out there saying 3,700. I don't know where those numbers are from. Uh, I, I think they're, you know, to be quite fair and honest, they're falsified. They're not true. Um, there's a lot of individual numbers. A lot of people just, you know, hanging out with local people, hanging out with, you know, uh, Muslims who are here as, um, uh, as fans, not as du'at, many of them actually and he accepted Islam once they knew about Islam as well. Um, you could see some of those, and there were some of them on, on some videos as well. They, these guys weren't du'at. They were just, you know, having a, a coffee or, or, or being with an individual in the mosque. 
explain a little bit about them and they will accept Islam right after that. So we don't have all of those numbers. So our group, a thousand plus, alhamdulillah. Um, <clears throat> uh, also, there was, they said, you know, the Kuwaiti brothers and sisters who came, small group, they have about a hundred plus. Our brother Abdullah from Saudi had about 50. So you have a lot of different individuals and it maybe it can come up to about, you know, about 2000, I guess at the end, uh, it could come up to that. But, you know, th those are the, the official numbers that we know uh, and Allah knows best. I'm there obviously trying to keep in touch with those brothers and sisters uh, to help them, you know, through, through their journey as new Muslims now as well. Um, we gained obviously a lot of experience uh, for future uh, events like this, uh, a, a lot of experience, you know, so now in the future, we'll know how to deal with those things better, alhamdulillah. Like we said, we, we learn about the reality of men, of those who claim to be men, those who claim to be working for the dawah, uh, who do a lot of talk, but don't walk the walk. That was a, a great experience, a great eye opener for us. Um, we know a lot for the future and deal with, with these individuals and dealing with others and he, like them as well. Um, also, we learned about the, the dawah techniques that actually work and the ones that do not. We mentioned a lot of those during the session. We also and he learned about the forgotten continent, which we've been talking about for years. But many people, unfortunately, um, don't still don't focus on, on South America or, or giving dawah and, and Spanish and what have you. And we see the impact that that can have. And hopefully, inshallah, this will open up the door for that in the future, inshallah. Uh, and also, and he, I think many people saw um, the issue of. Um, you know, the, the, the taqseer, the shortcomings that we have as an ummah, as individuals when it comes to giving da'wah and sharing this, this beautiful message with others. People realize how, how much of impact we can have and how little we're, we're actually doing to support the da'wah. So alhamdulillah, we're hoping now that this actually opened up, you know, for brothers and sisters, you know, to give more da'wah in the future, inshallah ta'ala. And um, I'll end with, with two things. One of them... Uh, Alhamdulillah, I'm always, always trying to, I say, I'm a student of the game. So I always try to learn, you know, and um, one of the things that I learned from uh, Imam al-Tirmidhi, rahimahullah ta'ala, Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, said to him, and al-Tirmidhi is from his students. He said to him, the sheikh is saying to the student, Imam Bukhari is saying to Imam al-Tirmidhi, he said, I learn more from you than you learn from me. Imam al-Tirmidhi was shocked. How is that? He said, because you're constantly asking questions. So me, myself, I always want to ask questions. I always want to better myself. How can I become better? Even if I feel certain individuals, maybe I, maybe when it comes to certain aspects of Islamic knowledge, maybe I have more than them. But still, I'm still a student of the game, the game of, of da'wah, the game of, of, of knowledge. I always want to learn, always want to better myself. Alhamdulillah, that's how we need to be as Muslims. So one of the things that we, we, we're, we're I, I, one of the brothers, he invited us, over dinner at his house, beautiful, beautiful dinner, mashallah. Um, uh, Palestinian brother, uh, he's a local now, Qatari brother, originally Palestinian, mashallah. He invited us over to his house, very beautiful Palestinian uh, cuisine, mashallah. So after we ate very well, mashallah, we had the dua from all around the world. I said, each one gives one benefit, one dawah benefit that we can benefit from. So one of the beautiful dawah benefits was from our brother Salman the brother from Japan who translated the Quran to Japanese, he talked about teamwork. And the beautiful thing about it, it's the same example that I always give in my courses, but he added something very unique to it, something extra. Because you know, we always talk about the importance of teamwork. Everyone has their role. Everyone plays and does something in order to help out the Dawah. Just like the football team. We're, we're talking about World Cup, we're talking about football, right? So just like... Um, the uh, the football team, if you have a superstar, but the players with him are not good, he's not going to win. If you have two or three superstars, but the rest are not good, they're not going to win. If you have a, a good starting 11, but you have a weak reserves, you're not really going to win all the time, right? Sometimes. If you have a, you know, good players, bad coach, not going to win. You have good coach, but a, a bad medical staff, you're not going to win. Bad administration, not, everyone has to play their role. You'll see injured players, like the Moroccan players, they were injured. Medical staff doing a fantastic job of being able to get them out there. If you if you watch the NBA, like my, I'm, a, I'm more of a basketball man myself, right? So if you ask, uh, if you look at um, on, on the NBA front, 
last year, the, the Eastern Conference Finals, Jimmy Butler, this guy was finished, completely dead. He couldn't move, you know? And then the guy comes back like a, a game or two later and scores like 46 points. What did this guy come The medical team got him back out there. So that was part of the, of the role, right? So you, you, it's a complete any package in, in order for the Dallas to be successful. What did our brother Sun Man add? He said, look at the Japanese fans who are part of the movement, part of this, how they were cleaning up the stadium and this. So it's just that complete system, not just the players, not just the, the, the administration, not just the coach, even the fans with them as well. So I said, that's amazing. That's deep. It's even more than we're always talk about. The fact that you have those individuals who are, um, who are out there working hard, alhamdulillah, to support uh, to support any the, the team. And that's how we need our individuals out there is to support the Dow as well. Support the Dow in every way you can, inshallah. And the last thing we'll end with, inshallah ta'ala, um, is, you know, from the benefits that came from this is uh, my new podcast, which inshallah ta'ala is going to be out. Hopefully the brother who's translating is here with us tonight because we're, we're doing an Arabic and English, alhamdulillah. And we're going to be, uh, you know, we have the subtitles in, in, in the language, the other language. If it's in English, it'll be subtitles obviously in Arabic. If it's in Arabic, subtitles are going to be in English. So alhamdulillah, uh, we're spo it's supposed to be the 20th of January, putting our translator on the spot for the first uh, of the 21st, inshallah, maybe the 20th. Hopefully it shall be ready by next week or by the end of the month, at least, inshallah. And we'll start putting those podcasts out regularly, inshallah. So that's one of the good things that came. And how did that come? It came and from our brother Silman from Japan, so that, you know, giving Dao in Japan is different from other countries because the ROI for people, you know, who are investing in Dao, it wasn't coming with results. So my question now as a student of the game is why? So as I sat down with him to ask him questions, I said, you know what? I said, we have a lot of guys here. And he was, he was going to the airport, by the way. May Allah bless him. He's there, finishes it. I said, okay, I have my brother Rafael from Mexico. I have my brother Cueva from, uh, from the Philippines. I have... Um, I have also, um, uh, you know, br brother Abdullah from Saudi who's, who's good when he's using the Bible. I can benefit, and brothers can benefit from him. Isa Garcia, amazing experience in South America. Uh, brother Eddie from Brazil, others. So we, we did, we have about 12 podcasts. We have a very special guest who all of you love, inshallah ta'ala. We'll keep that name secret for now. Inshallah, he'll be the first podcast. So if you can check that out that on my YouTube channel. If you're not uh, with me on the YouTube channel, we can ask our brother now, uh, Abdibari to please put in the description below uh, the link to my YouTube channel uh, with the brothers who are, who are on Zoom. And once he finishes as well, uh, Abdibari, if you could please put it on the uh, Facebook page and the, the Instagram as well. And we'll stop the live now, inshallah, on Facebook and Instagram and the brothers and sisters who are with us uh, on, um, on the Zoom, inshallah, if you have any questions with the Academy, Sahaba Academy. We'll answer those inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Wallahu alam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa barakatuh. Nabi Muhammad.